In the Second World War, almost a million Australian men and women served across the globe. Over 30,000 did not return home. But the number of Australians captured was almost eight times more than in the First World War, and the majority were prisoners of the Japanese. Almost 15,000 of the 22,000 Australian servicemen captured by the Japanese were taken at the fall of Singapore in February 1942. A third of them would die in captivity. Australians were imprisoned by the Japanese in many places, Malaya, Burma, Thailand, Java, Sumatra, Borneo, Manchuria, Formosa, now Taiwan, and on the islands of Ambon and Hainan. The Japanese saw their prisoners as a vast and disposable labour force and forced them to build railways and airfields and work in mines and factories and shipyards. For nearly four years, Australian POWs battled disease, starvation, exhausting work and brutal, callous treatment from their captors. Nearly 8,000 Australians died as prisoners of the Japanese, one quarter of all the Australians who died in World War II. And they died in desperate, degrading conditions. Other Australians were held in Italian and German prison camps in World War II, almost 9,000 men. Most were infantry captured in Greece and Crete, or RAAF aircrew, who were generally taken prisoner after being shot down. These prisoners too suffered some brutality and mistreatment. 250 of them died during the war, but the conditions of their captivity were generally better than their comrades in the Pacific. Some 1,500 Australian civilians mostly women and children, also spent World War II in captivity, interned by the Japanese. Unfortunately for them, they were in the wrong place at the wrong time and were swept up when the Japanese invaded places like Malaya, China and Rabaul. Australian Army nurses were also captured, the most well-known group enduring the war in prison in Sumatra but only after the Japanese had massacred 21 of them. A further eight would die in captivity. Though they weren't made to work, they also suffered deprivations and humiliation. Australia imprisoned its own POWs during World War II both civilian and military. In the interests of what was called national security, the Australian government interned civilians of German, Italian and Japanese extraction in makeshift camps, mostly in remote country locations. Australia also held over 25,000 military personnel during the war, Japanese, Germans and Italians. Many of the Italians were allowed out to work on farms but the Germans and Japanese were held in high security camps. Conditions in these camps were acknowledged to be fair and reasonable, but despite this, a mass breakout of Japanese POWs occurred in a camp in Kaura in New South Wales in 1944. 234 Japanese and four Australian soldiers died in the ensuing chaos. Sergeant Keshen was just 21 years old. Well, I came down out of the hills and you got no idea what the bedlam was. 
There was blacks everywhere without rifles. They'd thrown everything away and they were just marching out. A voice said, put your arms down and turn around slowly. And I looked at my shoulder and it was a German. He had his gun train on me. And it all sort of happened in a flash. But to me, it was slow motion. So I thought I'd got no option. There was a creek alongside the road, so I just threw the gun in it and I turned around slowly. I was a prisoner of war. In early 1942, Japanese troops moved through Southeast Asia with stunning speed. So quickly did they advance that tens of thousands of people suddenly came under their control. Hundreds, including women and children, were murdered rather than being taken prisoner. The rest were forced into camps. Most of the Australians captured by the Japanese in the Second World War were imprisoned during that time. 36% of them, over 8,000 men and women, would die in captivity. The city of Singapore had nearly fallen when all the Australian Army nurses were ordered out. Some sailed on a ship called the Empire Star, which made it back to Australia. But Pat Darling was one of the nurses on another ship, the Viner Brook, and when it was bombed, the nurses had to go overboard. There were dead bodies floating around already because people had jumped overboard and the, the life belt had gone up and put a breath in their necks as they hit the water. We found a spur and hung on to it for a long time. About eight o'clock next morning, we were still struggling and we were well and truly, we were probably only 200 yards from the shore at the stage so you could see the Japs and the uh, shore. We didn't know which way to pull the, try and pull the thing. Anyway, they came out in a boat and they, they were quite kind and gentle. They pulled us on board. Then they took us to a house. There was a dead Indonesian lying nearby. And the little Japanese, who was quite a polite little fellow, was showing us around and telling us to take what we wanted. We didn't like to take very much. He took from the uh, wall a mirror and showed me myself and I was horrified. My hair was full of black oil. Ships have an amazing amount of oil. And my face was purple, my skin's, my eyes were scarlet. And I sort of went, oh, how terrible. And of course, he doubled up with mirth, which I was relieved at because it was a normal reaction. And one just thought, you know, thank goodness they're human. 1,500 Australian civilians were also captured by the Japanese. Many were children. Sheila Brune was just 17 years old when the Japanese marched her into Changi Jail. On the 8th of March, we were told that we were going to Changi Prison, so we marched there, the eight miles, in the hot sun. Some of the locals cheered and some of the locals jeered, threw things at us. We had dogs following us. And if we didn't walk, we got prodded with a, with a uh, butt of the rifle and uh, things like that. We were hungry, we were thirsty, we were dusty. Children were crying. Pregnant and women were tired. It was chaos, but when we, when we saw the jail, the British women started to sing, they'll always be in England. And the men that had already been there before us clapped. To combat the boredom, many prisoners began what they called barbed wire universities. In Stalagluf III, a permanent camp for airmen that would later become famous for the great escape, pilot officer Jeff Cornish remembers how, in the beginning, 
Lifting the men's spirits through classes really worked. It doesn't matter what you wanted to do, there was somebody in that camp, remembering there were about two and a half thousand people who'd either fully completed their tertiary education or well into it before they joined up. If you wanted to learn photography, if you wanted to learn to make wine and to distill spirits, there's somebody who'd do it for you. If you wanted to learn Mandarin Chinese, Squadrolina Murray had been in Hong Kong and the Far East for 12 years and he spoke fluent Chinese. You could learn Japanese, Russian was a very popular choice. A lot of people learnt French while they were there. I had the science master from Edinburgh University giving me one-on-one -on -one tutorials in chemistry and physics. He was delighted, it was kept him interested and occupied and uh, it was great tuition for me. Keen to keep their minds active, the prisoners took to making tools, toys and musical instruments. They concocted lessons and debates from whatever they could remember. Whatever subject a prisoner might have some knowledge about was passed on to others. Wherever they were imprisoned, and while their bodies held up, Australian servicemen found a way to play sport. If they didn't have the equipment, they constructed it, and if they couldn't play their usual games, they adopted the local ones. At one stage we had a, an oval which was big enough to play cricket. There was a cricket match, the Aussies versus the Poms, of course, as you would expect. There was volleyball. In winter, we even constructed a uh, ice rink, which was about the size of a hockey pitch poured some water onto it and we, we had our, an ice rink. There was a soccer pitch and, and uh, some of the guys played soccer. I tried it once and got sacked. I, they invited me to be goalkeeper and I let too many balls in, they sacked me pretty quick and lively. On just the second day of their captivity inside Changi Jail, an Australian concert party gathered together and began rehearsals for a show. It was typical of what were probably the most surprising and unique theatrical productions that had ever taken place anywhere. Sheila Brune remembers some of the shows she witnessed in Changi Jail. Concerts usually consist of a variety of items. There would be a singer, a comedy act, a couple of dancing acts, sort of a fashion parade, chorus singing, chorus dancing, acrobatics. We even had put on a circus, which was quite extraordinary considering we didn't have much in the way of costumes. Got a fat lady and a boxing kangaroo and performing seal, a trapeze artist. It's quite amazing what talent there was when you start looking around. In camp after camp throughout Europe and in Southeast Asia, the POWs showed remarkable inventiveness and skill, performing everything from Shakespeare to variety concerts, some forming symphony orchestras using musical instruments supplied by the Red Cross. Theatrical sets and lighting were made from whatever material they could find, borrow or steal, and once they even managed to smuggle a full drum kit into Changi Jail piece by piece under their sarongs. The women's roles in the plays were performed by men, and Marek Gilbert, imprisoned by the Japanese on the island of Ambon, can still remember his first time on stage. Somehow or other, they persuaded me <laughs> to play the female lead. <laughs> well, of course, the first obstacle to overcome is the matter of boobs. Well, what better than getting a hold of a coconut shell, cutting it in half? And I must say, that, that did the job fine. But then there was uh, the problem of dress. But somehow, somebody got hold of a dress from the, the Dutch women in the compound adjacent to the camp. And as for hair, well, I put a, I put a handkerchief or something over my head. And here I was playing the role of, a, mm, I don't know what he called it, Mabel, but that was the role. That was <laughs> my first debut, really, on the stage. <laughs> Anyway, it was all good fun and um, I liked the 
think that it, it all helped. We all helped to uh, break the boredom and improve morale as well. Prisoner of war camps are small contained worlds in which civilised human behaviour is often absent. Yet even though Australian prisoners had many reasons to dislike, perhaps even to hate, their captors, they found that a few treated them with compassion and humanity. Only once in one camp I was in, there was a Jap guard, he was a soldier, he was an engineer. His name was Horiyushi. And he told us that he was a Christian. And he acted as one, you know. He was as good as he could without losing face amongst his coppers. He treated us with whatever he could. Uh, in, in the two camps that I spent with him, the Japanese camps on the Thai Burma Railway were brutal places and Dr. Lloyd Cale and his men endured beatings and starvation. But on a rusty, decrepit cargo ship on their way back to Singapore, Lloyd encountered some unexpected behaviour from his enemy. There was a little Japanese lieutenant who could speak very good English there and talked to him a bit. And I don't know how long we might have been, 10 days or a fortnight or something, getting down there. And he became very interesting and he told me he'd been a professional baseball player and he'd been in Manchuria fighting and so forth and so on and da 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 da. And he had no doubt that they were going to lose the war. And I used to talk to him there and at night and he got on and one night he said to me, when this war is over, what will happen to you? And I said, well, I don't know. If I, if I survive, I'll go back to my country. He said, back to your country? And I said, yes. He said, oh, I cannot understand that. And I said, why? He said, oh, we cannot do that, no. And he stopped then for a while and he said, do you see that star up there? And I said, yes. And he said, do you see that star up there? And I said, yes. He said, that's your God, that's my God. And that's about as near as I've ever got to the Japanese. Australia, very interesting little bloke, really. In some of the German camps, the prisoners continued to wage war in the only way they could by continually plotting escape. They looked on some of their guards with contempt. The difference between the prisoners and the guards was that the quality of the guards, <laughs> on a scale of A to Z, they were Z. Because anybody with any intelligence or ability was at the fighting front and the guards who were too old or too stupid, and, but in the services, were sent to be guards to us. That suited us fine, because to be an air crew, your educational level had to be very, very high indeed. We had 24 hours a day, seven days a week, doing nothing but plot how we would get out of it, and how we would outwit the Germans, psychologically, physically, in every possible way, bluff, whatever. In Southeast Asia, the Australians could not behave that way with their Japanese and Korean guards. For one thing, escape was virtually impossible. Still, the prisoners found other ways to strike back, often by giving the guards nicknames. Athel Moffat was a prosecutor in the war crimes trials at the end of World War II, and he collected a list of these nicknames. Here are just a few. Ming the Merciless, Intercourse, Intercourse Henry, The Ghost, Flannelfoot, The Weather, Weasel, Junior Ball Kicker, Little Marmite, Scarface, Red Eyes, Gold Tooth, Joe Louie, Fish Face, Goldfish, Sailor, the Big Cook, Frenchie, Wrestler, Tick, Quick Quack, Big Annie, Whispering Bear, Big Marmite, Mr Middleton Jr, Bullfrog, Maggots, Ball Kicker, Little Ball Kicker. <laughs> but 
the overwhelming memories the prisoners of the Japanese have of their guards are unpleasant and dark. It was so depressing, uh, this dark tunnel and no light at the end of it because we had no news. It was day after day, we lived on our nerves. We didn't know whether we'd be alive tomorrow or the next day or the next day because they'd shoot you for nothing or belt you for nothing. So we were living on our nerves day by day. In prisoner of war camps, the biggest dangers to morale were boredom and despair. So some prisoners invented unique ways of coping with the isolation and repetition of everyday life. Malcolm Keschen was imprisoned in Stalag 383 in Hohenfels, Germany. In, in 383, you're looking for something to do all the time, something to occupy you. Educated blacks used to walk around the camp talking to themselves. There was one bloke that used to walk around and around the camp talking to himself, reciting Shakespeare. And he could tell you anything you want to know about Shakespeare. But he went nutty in the finish. He couldn't help it. The only one who survived was McGinney. We had a big pool, fire, what they called a fire pool. It was filled with water in case of fire and after a while it used to get very murky. And McGinty used to sit on the side of that with a stick and a piece of cotton and he used to fish in it. And he'd sit there for hours and blokes would come along and they'd look at him, you know. He survived. <laughs> Sometimes humour took a turn into areas that some people might regard as in bad taste. Yet this was their life for those horrendous years. If they could not find humour in it, they would have had to succumb to despair. Tom Pledger remembered one of those sorts of stories from Ambon. I'll tell you a funny story about a Dutchman. They're on a work party and there's nothing around anywhere. Anyhow, he traded something in for two pork chops. He couldn't keep them on him while he was working because he only had a pair of shorts on. So he wrapped them up in this paper and he put them under a tree, a shrub. So then when they were going to come home, he grabbed them and put them in, he put his shirt on with it, put them in his shirt, hopped on the truck and he's there and the Jap guard's got his hand on his shoulders and that. He didn't know that all his pork chops were covered in these great big bull ants. And they started to bite all around his testicles and that. And he couldn't do a thing. He had to put it with that for they drove the 10 kilometres back to camp. We had him in hospital for over a fortnight. The sweat and all that around his groin, <laughs> I just took to him. <laughs> but he said he had his chops. <laughs> These are the stories that former prisoners of war laugh at again when they meet at reunions. They help to protect them from the bad memories. And they may laugh, but they also never forget. On the Burma-Thailand Railway, British prisoners of war died at twice, sometimes three times the rate of the Australians, partly because of the better health of the Australians at the beginning of the war, and partly because of their practical skills and hygiene. But the strength of the Australians as a group also saved many men who would otherwise have died. There was a saying, and it's true, that uh, any POW who didn't have a mate uh, had nothing. He, he had nothing to live for. And he, every one of us had someone to care for us, and we cared for them. It was a, a relationship more than uh, just friendship. It was. Uh, Away and above that, uh, mateship is a special circumstance. It was, uh, uh, you live for one another. Uh, you know, you looked after, they looked after you when you were sick, you looked after them when they were sick. In the women's camps and the civilian camp where Sheila Brune was a teenager, it was no different. Having somebody that you can 
always depend on no matter what sort of person you are, they still accept you. It does mean a lot in life to be able to rely on somebody like that, particularly when it's a matter of life and death. You know that it didn't matter what you did, you've got somebody there who will help you and try and understand. To give some encouragement or a thoughtful hand when another prisoner was in despair took on enormous significance. Desmal Kay remembers a mate, Freddie, who had a knack for helping others in prison in Japan. If I saw one of the blokes starting to get a bit down in the dumps, a bit morose, I'd just say to Fred, Fred, I think so and so could do the half hour of your talk. You gonna be out with him? Oh yeah, Freddie go down. Sit down with this bloke. Before you say Jake Robinson, you'd have this bloke laughing and joking and talking. And he'd completely change him around altogether, you know. And he didn't do one, he'd done a dozen blokes that fellow. He was absolutely fantastic. Where you could get them back up all the, the feet again. He had no education whatsoever, it was just his manner. of survival for all Australian prisoners of war was food, how to get it and how to keep on getting it. In Reg Worthington's camp in Salonika in Greece during the Second World War, one food supply came from an unlikely source. I know at one stage the, the little fox terrier dog came into the, into the area. Yeah, well, I think he was a foxy, but a small a dog similar to the size of a foxy. And we all chased him. Our, our bloke caught him. He tasted pretty good in the, in the stew. <laughs> uh, poor little dog. But uh, survival was very strong. Only a limited amount of food was supplied to POWs and it would never be enough for everyone. So the dividing and sharing of food became incredibly important. They had nothing there to give us much to eat but a bit of watery cabbage soup in the morning. Uh, you used to get a, a small round flat roof about that big, it had to go to eight prisoners, so you got a little wedge. And, and that in itself, was, if it wasn't serious, was comical because you'd select one to cut it and all the eyes would be on that they didn't get any more than the next one. And then, of course, you drew cards to have your pick. <laughs> and I can tell you, I, I doubt if there wouldn't have been a slither of stuff more on one cut than the other. And that's all you got all day. And, uh... In the Japanese camps, the prisoners had to quickly get used to a food that Australians didn't really eat at that time. Rice. Most of the rice the Japanese gave the prisoners was of terrible quality. It was often contaminated with rat droppings and worms, and a lot of it was simply sweepings from barn floors. Howard Walker, the son of missionary parents, was a 14-year-old boy in an internment camp in China, and here he reads a poem written by another prisoner about the miseries of eating this rice. We got baked rice and caked rice that weevils made their bed in. We got bad rice, sad rice that filled you with its sorrow. We got podgy rice, stodgy rice that meant tummy pains tomorrow. We got limed rice, grimed rice and ought to have been crimed rice. We brewed rice, we chewed rice. The lucky ones, they spewed rice. We starved on but we lived on in spite of everlasting rice. The prisoners had to get protein wherever they could find it, and sometimes that meant they ate things they would otherwise never have considered. Even dirty rice could contain protein. 
Later, our doctors wouldn't let them wash it because they had grubs and grub nests in it. And uh, if you washed them out, there was, uh, you washed all the vitamins out. So when you were eating your rice, you'd see little brown heads <laughs> looking at you. So yeah. it's surprising what you can make out of a bowl of rice when you've uh, been on it for so long. You can really imagine a nice roast dinner and roast potatoes and all this sort of thing. Uh, but you come back to the real world after a while. <laughs> The prisoners of war of the Japanese were provided with a totally inadequate diet that led to some starving to death. If you didn't go to work, you didn't get fed. If you stayed back in camp, your rations were cut down, so you had to share. You got what was given to you as, as a sick patient, which was not always as much even as a working man. So if you got sick, you, you were not as well off as it meant you didn't work, but it didn't mean you were going to survive any quicker. In World War II, the Japanese wanted to build a railway line from Thailand to Burma that would enable them to supply their troops already in Burma. It was an idea that had been rejected by other nations before, on the grounds that the countryside was too dangerous and too many workers would be lost to disease. But the Japanese used the slave labour of their POWs. It was estimated that constructing the Burma-Thailand Railway involved building four million cubic metres of earthworks, moving three million cubic metres of rock and building 14 kilometres of bridgeworks, all over a period of about 10 months and using tools that would not have been out of place in the Middle Ages. 260,000 people were slave labourers on that railway, 61,000 of them POWs. 30,000 labourers and 12,399 prisoners would die, including 2,646 Australians. In that terrible place, the former POWs have the highest of praise for their doctors, without whom, they believe, thousands of them would not have made it home. Tom Uren worked alongside another doctor, Lieutenant Colonel Edward Weary Dunlop. Weary's leadership wasn't pronounced or boasted about or loudmouthed in any way. He was a very quiet, quietly spoken human being. He led by example. In our camp, with under Weary, we were the strong was looking after the weak, the young was looking after the old, the fit was looking after the sick, and there was this collective philosophy. It's reasonable to expect that when soldiers become prisoners of war, they are safe for the moment. A prisoner has no weapons, he is no real threat. But in many POW camps, the death rate actually increased after capture. Some died from wounds or starvation or disease or beatings. But others died simply because they lost the will to live. I had always believed that there was a will to live, and if that will to live disappeared, uh, well, you died. Uh, there's much more to it than that, I'm sure of that. It's a bit like bone pointing. You point the bone at yourself, I guess. I've seen many cases of fellows who have been nigh unto death for maybe a couple of weeks, semi-conscious most of the time, being hand fed by their mates, amazing to still stay alive. And then when they recover from that, and they're starting to be getting better or uh, think they're getting better, they just up and die on you. And I think what had happened to them was that they'd look around and see fellas dying around them and think, oh, it's, it's too hard now, let me go. 
In many camps in World War II, the prisoners hid their biggest hopes and most dangerous secrets, forbidden radios and their plans for escape. The radios were used to keep the men's spirits up and news was passed secretly from man to man. BBC news would come on about seven o'clock. We wouldn't hear it, it would be on a secret radio somewhere. We would be taken down in shorthand and then the reader would be snuck from one hut to the next and it'd come in and there'd be someone to sing out news up and everybody would be quiet. The BBC news was read out and the fellow would disappear off to the next hut. And that's how we kept up with the news. The biggest blow a POW could deliver to the enemy was a successful escape, but not everyone was keen to try. Some POWs hated all those who tried to escape because of the punishments that were inevitably handed out to those left behind. A lot of people that were prisoner of war were happy to be prisoner of war. They weren't going to jeopardise their lives. When you're with people for a long time, you can practically tell whether a person is going to sit or a person is going to try to escape. There's a way they go about things. In Europe, the favourite method of escaping was difficult and dangerous, tunnels. But that could mean cave-ins that left them buried under tons of earth a foul air supply and no room in the tunnels to turn around. Still, these young men kept trying again and again. They were determined to escape. Jeff Cornish was in Starlag Luft III. Our average age in air crew who were shot down was probably 22 to 23, whereas in the naval camps and the army camps, where a whole group of men were captured at once. You had probably everything from a lieutenant colonel or a senior officer down. They'd learned a lot more of the common sense that you were talking about. We never had any other thought but to get out tonight or at the very latest tomorrow. And that was the overriding consideration and motivating force all the time. At least the POWs in Europe could try to escape. The chances of success from the Japanese camps in Southeast Asia were virtually nil. Eight blokes tried it. They all got caught, all brought back, and they were shot. Others tried it, and they died in the jungle. So you just didn't bother, there's nowhere to go. There's safety in numbers. It was safer to stay where you were than to try and take off. About 700 Australian POWs in Europe during the Second World War made it to safety after escaping. From the Japanese camps, it was less than 10. As the Second World War came to an end, the prisoners of the Germans were the first to be freed, but not before they experienced a terrible ordeal. German command ordered 280,000 prisoners and their guards onto the roads. Ray Corbett was marched from a camp in Poland. The worst winter in Germany's history, and it was cold, it was really cold couldn't take your boots off. They were just freeze stiff and you couldn't get them on again. But then next morning you'd be out and praise. All right, it's all in, move on. Then you start pounding along, pounding along. And then the tank, big tank came up the gate, pushed the wire down, and out pops the Yanks. We said, are you Yanks? They said, well, you sure are, buddy. We knew it was all over. And then suddenly, it's like taking a wet swimming, swimming suit off, you know. Everything just goes. The Germans surrendered on May the 8th, 1945, and the Japanese three months later on August the 15th. 
but no one was certain of the location of all the Japanese camps, and no news had been heard of some Australian prisoners for years. There had been rumours about the existence of Australian nurses in a prison camp somewhere, but they were denied by the Japanese. An Australian war correspondent, Hayden Leonard, began searching for them, and his persistence was rewarded and the camp was found. Pat Darling and the other nurses were going home. Eventually, we saw a plane arriving and it landed and the first person off was Dr. Harry Windsor. And he looked at us, we were, we were the only standing people. He said, where are the Australian nurses? And we laughed and said, we're here, because we were dressed as best as we could be. <laughs> On that plane was also the principal matron of Australia, matron Annie Sage, who had been desperate to find her nurses. Matron looked at us. Somebody said, but who are you? And she said, oh, I'm the mother of all of you. And ever since I've had this position, I've wanted to find out where I was determined to find you. And she said, she said, where are the rest of you? And of course, there was silence for a moment. Then a voice, I don't know whose it was, just said, they're all dead. Marek Gilbert was found on the island of Ambon. This wonderful sight came down and Bombay. Four corvettes of the Royal Australian Navy, and I'll tell you their names. The Juni, the Kutamandra, the Glenelg, and the La Trobe. I will never forget those names. I was on the Juni. Our own officers here had us lined up and we were assembled and uh, greeted by these fellas on the corvettes. And, uh, well, it's very, very hard to, to really to put into words our emotions at, at that happening. It was just so wonderful. The POWs were, of course, delighted at the rapid change in their fortunes. But many were also stunned at the changes that had occurred in the world while they were in prison. Ray Parkin was released from a camp in Japan. We didn't know just what had happened, but there were three major things that happened. The atomic bomb, jet propulsion. We did see a couple of jets come over. A and the third one was the biro pen. Oh, it was a, a pen you could, oh, they said at the time, you know, you don't have to refill it, it'll write for two years. Bullshit. <laughs> that was the one thing we wouldn't believe. <laughs> was the bar open. <laughs> that was impossible. <laughs> Australia. Already 800 of their covers are in Darwin Harbour, arriving on the Dutch hospital ship Orania, to be greeted by thousands of service personnel who line the wharf in a real Australian welcome. When Australian prisoners returned home, the country gathered them to its heart in relief and triumph. Yet, as James Ling remembers, many prisoners were unsure of their welcome. We were naturally wildly excited, uh, but a little apprehensive, and that was very definite, because we don't, didn't know how we were going to be greeted. Our first thoughts were we surrendered, and nobody will want to talk to us. These other people have been in a war for three and a half years, all the people that we knew, and we really were apprehensive. It wasn't talked about publicly, but we, amongst ourselves, and we all knew, we were all feeling much the same way. And uh, we just wondered whether we would be welcomed back to the country that was our home. It only took uh, us to get down through Martin Place and the double-decker buses to begin to think, well, perhaps people do want to see us. Uh, the place was packed. Uh, there was ticker tape, which we'd never seen before, everywhere. People were racing out trying to hand bottles of beer through the doors, and the welcome was absolutely overwhelming. At the end of the Second World War, Australia, like other countries, was not medically equipped to treat the mental state of the POWs. The families of prisoners were advised by the authorities to avoid mentioning the war if possible, 
or to change the subject. When we came out of the prison camp into England, we were mental. But no way in the world could sit down and talk to a civilian. When they start talking about what they went through, we just got bored. And we turn around and walk away. Terrible nightmares where I was back in the camp again and experienced all sorts of things. And I'd, you know, I'd wake up screaming or, you know, muck sweat or something. That they were very, very difficult. But I was strongly resolved to get back into civilian life, to find a wife and to start a family. Counselling. All these chaps slather back from a war now, they only go be there one day and they're out for counselling. We never had a counsellor in the world. We got straight off the boat and discharged and that was it. Nobody worried about it. Go to a doctor. They wouldn't know what was wrong. They got no idea what was wrong, what we'd been through.